I was going to say, I've never spent, uh, never spent Christmas here, but I can imagine it's pretty wild. I'll tell you what, in this consumer society where they put the uh, Christmas decorations up on the 4th of July, by the end of November, I'm uh, virtually exploding with Christmas spirit. Come on. I know you'll like this. At the tail end of the Cold War, 1989, Warren Zevon decided to make a cyberpunk album. It was an interesting concept, or maybe an interesting song cycle. The timing and subject matter were Warren Zevon. Just coming off a well-received comeback sobriety album, Sentimental Hygiene, 1987, Zevon wasted no time indulging his inner artist on the follow-up album. And he was only indulging himself on it. He had spent 1982 to 1987, about five years, immersed in isolation, obscurity, and absorbing the subject matter of the newly insurgent cyberpunk movement. William Gibson's novel Neuromancer and Cutting Edge Zines. The writer of songs like Roll in the Headless Thompson Gunner, Lawyers, Guns and Money, and Desperados Under the Eaves. Console Cowboys and the Cold Heart of Consumerism gave Zivon plenty of sonic cyberspace to explore the inhumanity of violence. The product was the accurately named, experimental, Transverse City, 1989. It was peculiar, far from well received, undercut with a certain technological or industrial hum, and fully Warren Zevon's own unique shade of American cyberpunk. By 1987, 1988, 1989, cyberpunk was abutting and about to break into the mainstream. Aesthetics were easy, no one owned cyberpunk, but music was a harder problem. Outside techno and synthesizers, and maybe the movie Blade Runner, the first waves of the cyberpunk movement, or mirror shades as it was originally deemed, were literary. Warren Zevon's Transverse City was not the only album by a mainstream artist in an attempt to do cyberpunk, although it was arguably one of the first. Transverse City's soft reception was probably a blessing as cyberpunk leaked into major studios, the similar in concept, though not sound, Cyberpunk 1993 by Billy Idol would be hammered by the mainstream upon release. Other pseudo-cyberpunk albums would follow in the 1990s, such as Donald Fagan's Comic Curiad 1993 and David Bowie's Outside 1995. It seemed the 1990s were dominated by 1970s rock stars, each hacking their own attempt at the cyberpunk concept. All of them had previously expressed interest in the internet as a new medium. The internet was one of the many shocks to the soon-to-break global system. Transverse City, though, would be Warren Zevon's only full concept album, if it is a concept album at all. He preferred to call the oddity a album of concepts, or themes, or simply a long song cycle. Only the first three or four songs of the album have any plot thread linking them. All the music on it does have a sense of disorienting futurism, defining the album as it was, in Zivon's own words, as a 2010 sci-fi project. Transverse City still featured the topics Zivon knew best. Crooks, killers, mercenaries, gunfights, addiction, broken hearts, and computer puns. His imagined 2010s are a lot like his 1970s then filled with guns and the cruel realism of the rockabilly Ibsen. Transverse City was produced as a therapy session for addiction burnout, cultural burnout, and economic burnout. One big burnout, be warned. Though, as the gonzo rocker himself warned as well, all my songs are really about fear. Zivon described the three influences behind Transverse City, the structure of William Gibson's novel Neuromancer, the density of Thomas Pynchon's novels, and his own time in splendid isolation away from the music business. In his going cold turkey exile from the music business between 1982 to 1987, Zivon had entered the underground. William Gibson's recently published novel Neuromancer, 1984, in the public imagination, Neuromancer was the codifier of the cyberpunk movement and cyberpunk novel structure. A book aflame with static, social stratification, and cyberclash. 
though Gibson had famously typed the novel on a low-tech 1920s typewriter. Though Neuromancer is a sort of cyberpunk bible today, it was the obscure product of an irrelevant, on a literary perspective, movement in 1984, as Yvonne was famous for sniffing out the next best thing. Warren Zevon was no literary slouch either, and his reading habits were legendary in the music business. Posthumously called the Mad Poet, Zevon could reference Marcel Proust, Thomas Mann, Martin Heidegger, Oscar Wilde, and pulp mystery novels all in one conversation. In philosophy, he was fond of Arthur Schopenhauer and Soren Kierkegaard. Both would be relevant to the thematic aspects of Transverse City. Neuromancer appears to have been Warren Zevon's introduction to the cyberpunk movement, after which he wasted no time chasing down copies of obscure cyberpunk magazines and newsletters to digest, such as Cheap Truth. It's highly likely Zevon was familiar with Gareth Bronwyn's Is There a Cyberpunk Movement manifesto through these magazines. Though, Warren Zevon was noticeably careful about using the term cyberpunk in reference to Transverse City and in interviews. If this was purposeful on Warren Zevon's part, or if because the word cyberpunk was not yet saturated in the public consciousness, is unknown. It's entirely possible he simply did not want to have to explain the term. In interviews, he rarely, if ever, used the term, preferring to instead brand the album as sci-fi. Upon his return from Japan in July 1988, Zevon began to refer to the project as a 2010 sci-fi project, likely inspired by Japan's environment, until it acquired the title Transverse City. As Zevon explained, I don't think that is something I can set out to do, to say this is going to be dark but funny. I never really think that. With Transverse City, what I thought was that Gibson was going to influence the atmosphere of the album. I don't know if that turned out to be true. Warren perceived a kinship between his and Gibson's subject matter. Questionable mercenaries, often of decadent origins, who take to the warpath for a living or a thrill. In many cases, the thrill is the living for Zvon and Gibson characters. The son of a mobster, violence was a subject close to Warren Zvon's heart. Perhaps he was attracted to cyberpunk by the defining, though now cliché quote from Gibson, the street finds its own use for things or at least something of that thematic message. Bloodshed, capitalism of violence, and mercenary intentions. Warren even went as far to say Transverse City acted as his own personal checklist for the ills of society. On the structure of the album, Zivon continued from Gibson to penner of postmodern doorstoppers Thomas Pynchon, and I had sort of loftier ideas about Pynchon. I thought that his influence was going to be more structural or textural. This is a very lofty idea for something that turned out to be a rock and roll album much like the others. But given unlimited time and money, more of the album would have been like Run Straight Down, with all the different elements occurring at once. On a lot of levels, much like the opening scene of Gravity's Rainbow. Zivon often name-checked Pynchon's most popular novel, Gravity's Rainbow, 1973, in relation to the planned structure of Transverse City, but he was familiar with Pynchon's wider catalog. He also owned a first edition copy of Pynchon's Vineland, 1990. The intention was to ape or pay homage to Pynchon's massive, dizzying, cartoonish, and an entertaining way, narratives. Like Pynchon's novels, Transverse City begins to artistically fragment and break down, like the narrative in Gravity's Rainbow. Absurdity is never too far from the surface in either author. Both shared a talent for the straight-faced delivery of the absurd. One theme that gave Zemon an affinity for Pynchon was their shared obsession with entropy, both mechanical and personal. The concept of energy especially prominent in Transverse City, really the exhaustion of energy, a sort of scientific karma of the world. Zivon was coming off a five-year reprieve due to burning himself out with drugs and alcohol. His addictions were a fire that burnt several close bridges that would take decades to recover afterwards. The first half of his music career had been spent burning the candle at both ends. His fascination with technology and music, computers, or the commercial would inherit this manifestation or interpretation of entropy. Nothing lasts and everything runs straight down to the bottom or becomes absolute chaos. The perspective of the exhausted alcoholic writer, comparisons to F. Scott Fitzgerald were not uncommon either. By the late 1980s, Zivon was soon perceiving his own failures, 
both in seriousness and in parody, in the wider world around him. Transverse City was going to be a sort of mirror of himself upon the world. By 1987-1989, Zivon had kicked the alcohol problem, but not the addictions. OCD and superstition were coloring Zivon's slow re-emergence into the music world. One of his girlfriends during his cold turkey exile period recalls he would often wash his hands hundreds of times a day. It was obvious obsessive compulsive disorder. Other compulsions were his penchant for grey during the period. Grey sweater, grey shirt, grey pants, grey car. Eventually buying so many grey Calvin Klein shirts they began to pile up in his apartment, never being opened. He had to buy them because they were grey. It often verged on paranoia. When at the store, Zivon would only buy items he deemed sufficiently lucky. A carton of milk was only lucky when Warren said it was so. Oftentimes it would take dozens of cartons to find the correct lucky milk. Other times he would rent the same movie, every few weeks, to watch it dozens of times in a row, refusing to watch anything else. The paranoia was appropriate for the end of the Cold War, but perhaps directed in the wrong direction. When Zivon remarked Transverse City was about the ills of society, kind of like a checklist, it was also a checklist about himself. As said, Warren Zivon had an affinity with Soren Kierkegaard, and both expressed their own anxiety in a sort of fear and trembling. It is no surprise his comeback sobriety album was titled Sentimental Hygiene. After Sentimental Hygiene, Zivon was bursting with ideas and concepts for that 2010 sci-fi project. The interests were still purely Zivonian, or song noir as some have called it, but he was soon boasting about a new sound for the album. The piano rock of Sentimental Hygiene had been a nostalgic comeback. Transverse City was going to be looking towards the future with a new guitar-based sound, influenced by everything from techno to folk to synths to whoever Warren could contact to work on the album with him. He wanted to display his guitar talents he had spent years training up while in exile. The album was going to be a medley from the start, or as Zivon had described it in reference to Pynchon, dense. He avoided the term concept album though, and preferred to refer to it as a cinematic song cycle. The new album would be lower budget though. Virgin Records had heard Zivon's pitch, and had been less than confident about it. From the get-go, Transverse City was an artist's album by a musician's musician. Warren Zivon enlisted a cavalcade of names to work on the album, but the amount of popular appeal on it was always in question. The songs were studio products, not hits made for the radio or live performance. Cutting edge was the word of the day for Transverse City. The album would live or die by that edge. Cyberpunk had even infiltrated the production of the album. Unlike Billy Idol's later 1993 effort, Transverse City was more discriminating in how it branded itself cyberpunk. Very carefully so. Zivon's influence was more thematic philosophical than purely aesthetic. The tracks would be cinematic with layers of overdubs, special effects, and engage in as much wordplay as Warren Zivon could manage on any of his albums. It was a new field to tell a story. The issue? No one was really interested from the get-go. It would still feature the violent, ironic vaudevillian scenario Zivon was known for, but it was a few years too early on the cyberpunk element. Not even Zivon's friends who worked on the album got what he was really going for. Actor Michael Ironside, who Warren Zivon had befriended in Alcoholics Anonymous and contributed vocals to Transverse City, admitted he had no idea what was going on in the album. On paper and in the studio, as CM Cushions put it, Zivon had succumbed to the romance of technology. Transverse City runs the entire gambit of emotions, real, fictional, conceptual, or even designer. Transverse City's album art presents that this is cyberpunk penned by Warren Zivon, heavy metal folk cyberpunk. Look, he's right there. Zivon, after all, puts in an appearance on all his album covers. His hair remarkable and dressed in a black grey sweater here, he is presented as the listener's DJ psychopomp into this neon twilight parody of the late Cold War world. The background at first appears to be a rainbow of cybernetic nonsense, but it is actually a series of low-rent malls, a Korean supermarket, advertisements, security guards, sales, and a disused space properly enough. 
the entire spiral shaped like a particle collider. Enter this world, this 2010 sci-fi, Transverse City. The album kicks off on the title, the eponymous Transverse City, a massive confusion, adventure, and doom. The synth Japanese chimes greet the listener to this world, and yes, that is Jerry Garcia on guitar. It's a sleek entrance tune like walking into a futuristic mall. Life is cheap and death is free. Begins the listener's vertigo fall into this world. Zivon wastes no time here revving up the wordplay. Past the condensation silos, past the all-night trauma stand, we'll be there before tomorrow. And endless neon vistas, castles made of laser light, take us to the shopping sector in the vortex of the night. A menagerie of material imagery, but it's all too sickly sweet like that Pollyanna mentioned in the song. An always positive face, likely of advertising. The chorus continues with a list of sardonic elements of this world. Test tube mating call, clergy of the mall, bloodbath magazine, and a narcoleptic dream. Some very Zavonian rhymes and futuristic commentary on modern living. Those poisoned waves of grain are the modern culture and environment of this transverse city. It's easy to become obsessed here. But be warned, every weekend lasts for months in Transverse City. The music directly segues into Run Straight Down, warns Yvonne's ode to acid rain, environmental collapse, and mechanization. Remember acid rain? I guess that got fixed. At least. Yes, that's Pink Floyd's David Gilmour on guitar, recorded in London and then sent to the studio, and J.D. Souther on the vocal harmonies. The song expresses Yvonne's electric folk rock style mixed with an industrial hum and heaps of post-production. Once again, cinematic song cycle. The entire song runs with an on and off sequence of chemicals listed in the background. All are dangerous elements or industrial byproducts that caused cancer and other biological slash environmental issues. Agent Orange, solvents, carcinogens, etc, etc. One of the dense, multi-layered, pinchin-esque narrative elements Zivon wanted in the album. It's about how both environment and social systems can collapse in modernity, benign neglect and entropy. I went walking in the wasted city, started thinking about entropy, smelled the wind from the ruined river, went home to watch TV. Maybe some slight social commentary on LA, which Zivon was very familiar with. Though, as he also warns, don't look left and don't look right. An ironic political statement, but also a truthful physical statement in the world of the song. Like Entropy, it all runs straight down into chaos. Once again, this is cyberpunk, so don't expect too much optimism. The encroaching helicopter and sirens bring the listener into direct conflict with the long arm of the law. Here the piano does burst out, but the cinematic elements of the album are on full display. It's a classic Warren Zevon character tale about a luckless mercenary a crook at the end of his chain. A semi-fictionalized Zevon in an exotic noir adventure, akin to his earlier song Lawyers, Guns, and Money. It may have been inspired by Zevon's run-ins with the Civil Guard and Franco's soldiers while working at David Lindau's bar, the Dubliner, in Spain, though Spain here has been transposed for Peru. After the war in Paraguay, back in 1999, I was laying low in Lima, working both sides of the borderline. This song also has a small breakdown interlude due to the contributions of jazz virtuoso Chick Corea. It's a song rife with paranoia, global law enforcement, raids, and the all-observant panopticon. You can run, but you can't hide. In this world, in this transverse city, someone is always coming after you and you are presumed guilty, and well, as it is cyberpunk, you probably are. Turbulence is the album's most rockin' track. It's about Russian soldiers bogged down in the deserts of Afghanistan. Zivon's commentary on the long quagmire that was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, during the album's production, a relatively recent event. Implied, in Transverse City, to maybe have caused a larger global fallout than it did in real life depending on how one interprets that turbulence. The narrator is a luckless inter-party scion that was exiled to the armed forces after some turmoil back in Moscow. The poor boy, a classic Zavonian term, 
is engaged in a political discussion, read Bellyaking, with a local named Shevar Nadsi. The song name drops Perestroika and Comrade Gorbachev. Zivan even peppers in some actual Russian for local invasion force color. His father was, after all, a Jewish-Russian immigrant. That Russian verse in translation states, according to Genius, Another village in a red sand desert, the silence of the enemy from every side, and I wanted to see Mama so much. Woo! And I wanted to see Mom so much. Loss and paranoia strikes deep, even on the opposite side of the Iron Curtain. If one wants the best track from Transverse City, listen to Turbulence. It even includes some classic Warren Zevon whoops and hollers. The first four songs establish the state of the world in the mirror darkly of Transverse City. They Move the Moon is essentially Zivon's classical synthesizer flourish. Jerry Garcia is once again on guitar, accompanied by Jack Cassidy of Jefferson Airplane on bass. Unlike the environmental and nuclear paranoia that colored the opening arc of the album, They Move the Moon is personal paranoia, literal atomization, the fantastic science fiction of disorientation. The whole world changes when one person looks away, one of the many lost love songs that fill the Warren Zevon catalog. Don't you know me anymore? Don't you want to love that's true? Don't you know my heart belongs to you? Though, as this is cyberpunk, the line, my heart belongs to you, just might be literal. The song fills the album slot for the slow, moody ballad, and can be contrasted with the quicker, quirkier networking. They Move the Moon is about the failure of modern relationships, and networking is about the shallowness of modern relationships. In Transverse City, reality is always worth questioning, even if it sometimes afflicts the soul with strange realizations. Those conversations at the end, in Realizations, splice into Splendid Isolation, the album's second major folk pop rock anthem, an ode to Warren Zevon's own time going cold turkey in Splendid Isolation. It's also about the American culture of narcissism, conspiracies, and once again, paranoia, though perhaps justified in the realm of a transverse city. Georgia O'Keeffe, Michael Jackson, and Goofy slash Disneyland are all name-dropped in the song. Zivon obviously has a kinship with all the personalities. I want to live alone in the desert. I want to be like Georgia O'Keeffe. I want to live on the Upper East Side and never go down in the street. Live in the desert, screen your calls, and put some tinfoil up on the windows. The song also has a killer harmonica solo by Neil Young. Yes, Neil Young is also on this album. Splendid Isolation is really the flip side of the American experience Zivon was parodying in the neon images of the opening song, Transverse City. Neither side, the social reject and the over-socialized, is morally good or bad, or worth morally judging at all, but both elements can be extremely corrosive to psychology if overindulged in. The taste of splendid isolation from the dangerous world, but too much disconnection can be an intoxication. By now, Transverse City has slipped more and more into the social peanut gallery aspect of sci-fi rather than the world building. Social dysfunction with a sheen follows. Networking then showcases when too much connection can be too much as well. Networking is about human relationships, in certain terms, and doing lunch all over town. It's the most folksy song on the album, but consider it folk music by an obsessive IT guy who works in the office. Zivon was already into computers by 1989, and was interested in the coming online society. The song is one long pun about computers. The chorus is the classical nerdy romantic to computer hardware compatibility refrain of networking I'm user friendly, networking I install with ease, data processed, truly basic, I will upload you, you can download me. When looking for love, everyone is user friendly. No, basic here is probably a pun on the basic programming language. Compared to, there's a prayer each night that I always pray, let the data guide me through every day, and every pulse and every code deliver me from the bypass code. Once again, this was 1989, so that's a lot of cutting edge jargon to use in a song. Modernity is either isolating or it forces everything through a hyperfixation. 
Gridlock is Warren Zevon's Gonzo Rock Ode to Traffic Jams, or more accurately, Los Angeles' Notorious Traffic Sprawl. It's a microcosm of the entire album in both sound and themes, featuring some work by common Zevon collaborator Jorge Caldron, a pseudo-ironic rock anthem about daily asinine inconveniences that kill a person bit by bit, second by second, cumulatively, especially the one called commuting. But those radicals can express themselves in total conformity within the system, within their car, which is stuck in traffic. It is the most cyberpunk song by the fact, as said, it's like a pseudo-ironic rebel anthem of a white-collar worker, the long-suffering victim stuck in their own existence. The only outlet is to scream, and to threaten to go postal. Let's get moving then. Down in the Mall could be mistaken for a Weird Al Yankovic song. There's no polka in it though, though it does sort of sound like Hardware Store. The song is an ode to American consumerism and cash culture. But even on this album, it's not as dour or down as one would expect. It's a rock pop dirge to malls, escalators, shoe shopping, and even a reference paid to video stores. Of course, the song has some words on spending solvency. We'll spend all the money the government doesn't take, and we'll put it on a charge account we're never gonna pay. All shopping spree intoxication down in the mall. Down in the Mall is the lightest song on the album, though it does have some shredding electric guitar, but it's not a bad song by any means. As the penultimate song, it's lighter fair to build up the end. If Transverse City is about Warren Zevon examining a cyberpunk world, Networking, Gridlock, and Down in the Mall are about the people who exist within that world, or maybe they're more or less stuck within it. That clinical, technical, economic language used in all three of those songs is carried over to the last crooning tune, Nobody's in Love This Year, and the rate of attrition for lovers like us is steadily on the rise. Nobody's in love this year, not even you and I. The rhythm is carried through the lyrics, a breakup song that sounds like a business invoice, an appropriate finale for the material of this album a tale about the failures of the literal sexual marketplace. Throughout the entire album, the scope has zoomed in from cities to highways to relationships to, now, the interior world of an individual. As with networking, Nobody's in Love This Year uses the language of an economic downturn to describe the failure or inability to form a meaningful relationship. It's economics applied to the world of love, as networking was computers applied to the world of love being the victim of one's own security in economic terms. You sit back and wait for your love to occur. You'll be waiting a long, long time. Nobody's in love this year, not even you and I. Old musicians lost lovers to booze, drugs, or gambling, but modern ones lose them to the lack of wanting one or the lack of emotions. No one's invested enough of themselves to yield to maturity. It is here Zivon flexes his blues influence in rhythm and lyrics. It is a particularly modern form of blues though. Addiction is substituted with compulsions, or the lack of said compulsions. There's also a good heap of commentary on modern emotions, or the lack therefore of them. The track does have some killer horn and string work though. Mike Campbell, of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, takes guitar and mandolin on this track. It's a somber, wistful note to close out the album and the world of Transverse City. The listener isn't going to get any answers. So what happened to Transverse City? The usual reception Warren Zevon albums got. Nobody got any answers. Nobody could be sold on the album by the cyberpunk concept alone. Zevon had been able to get a laundry list of features, Jerry Garcia, David Gilmore, Chick Corea, and even Neil Young. But the music simply did not sound like Zevon's typical material. Though the songs were not bad, they were not marketable either. Outside the fact they linked into one another through fades, the songs were studio projects which, outside networking and splendid isolation, could not really be played live. They were too complex, too reliant on in-studio work, and too convoluted to come across when attempted live. When they did show up in live performances, they went over poorly. In several of Mr. Zivon's dissonant keyboard solos and in some electronic effects, 
One also sensed the more esoteric musical side of the singer's personality, struggling for expression, as the New York Times put the issues in 1990. Zivan admits he could have kept working on the album forever. The only reason Transverse City did see release is because the money did run out. Even by that point, the album was still not dense enough, not in the number of songs, but in cinematic production. The album was a victim of Warren Zevon's compulsions, societal and personal, all of those he was trying to hew out in the studio and in the material. As Zevon later said about his own impending end, all good stories end in death. Transverse City was an imperfect mirage of an artist's vision. Unlike Billy Idol's Cyberpunk 1993, which, deserving or not, would be publicly flogged by critics and fans alike, Transverse City just faded into the background. Its reception was small and obscure. While not an absolute commercial failure, the Bizarre album did kill Zvon's deal with Virgin Records and sent him back out into the wilderness. It seems to have bothered him little or even set him back. Warren returned in 1991 with Mr. Bad Example, more folk neoclassical neo noir Warren Zevon, but Transverse City did not return. It remained an oddity for the next decade. The album was unremarked until it saw a memorial release in 2003 due to Warren Zevon's passing from mesothelioma. Once returned to public attention in the 2000s, the album found a warmer reception on the online. Transverse City did not lay claim to a cyberpunk mantle, but instead was Warren Zevon's own twist on the concept. Another look at a certain period of American society through mirror shades. As the population of the internet grew by the early 2010s, the odd attempt at a cinematic song cycle has found its place in the archives of internet interest. Not large, but there are a few good remarks on it. Transverse City at its release, escaped pretty much everyone. Though, as some have argued, Warren Zevon's reputation still escapes him to this day. As usual with science fiction, one is left to ask and wonder, how well did Transverse City predict 2010 and the world that followed after? And was it all that serious about predicting that world? Well, as Warren Zevon said, nothing's bad luck. Is it? Are you listening in the rain? Snow is glistening. A beautiful sight. We're happy tonight. Walking in a window wonderland. Everybody, gone away. I'd like to give a truly basic thank you to my supporter, the Gel Somini family. Is that new bird? He sings a love song. <laughs> Okay, look, the honest truth is I don't think this album is actually that bad. Maybe it's bad for Billy Idol, but like, it's okay as in just an album. 